It is again an honor and privilege to welcome the second speaker of our technical session, Anurita Pathak Madhul. An eminent women's rights activist, Anurita Pathak, has been associated with the Nautis Network, NEN, from 1998, beginning her stint with one of the earliest women's rights organizations of Northeast India as a student volunteer and is now the state coordinator of its Assam branch. She is renowned and revered for her immense contribution to the cause of empowering women in the region. She has been vocal on women's issues and is known for her work on gender and violence against women, representing voices of marginalized and disadvantaged women from local to global forums. In the year 2020, she was felicitated with the Global Award 2020 by Global Edu Leadership Forum for her unique contribution to the cause of women. She is a resource person on women's issues to several government and non-government UN agencies, educational institutions and public sector undertakings in the state and is a professional trainer on different gender issues. Apart from her master's degree from Guwahati University, she also has, to her credit, a specialization in women's human rights course from the University of Oxford. It would not be an exaggeration to say that her works ensure that the society should believe in the famous saying, try and leave this world a little better than you have found it. The KKH SOU fraternity is indeed very grateful to her for accepting our invitation and encouraging us with her presence today. Madam, it is an honor to have you with us today and uh, she will be delivering upon the topic Justice to Women Reflections from the Grassroots. I request Dr. Indrani Deka to kindly felicitate Dr. An Anurita Pathan, Madam. Thank you, Dr. Indrani Deka. Over to you, ma'am. We look forward to your deliberation. Thank you. A very good afternoon to the August gathering here. And I would like to thank the KKHSOU University for inviting Northeast Network and inviting me to share our grassroots experience. Uh, the keynote uh, address, the deliberations of the previous speaker were indeed very interesting because the concept of justice and gender-based violence, I'll be talking only on women. Because I have my reasons, I have my lived experiences and community experiences. So what happens is, uh, it, it, uh, it is complex. That's why we can never end in a 30-minute deliberation. And uh, my time slot is just about 30 minutes, we are running short of time. I represent the Nordic Network, which is a women's rights organization active in Meghalaya, Assam and Nagaland for the past 27 years. Since I don't need to talk of uh, uh, what is the fast track code, what does it do, how does it affect, what are its advantages and disadvantages, I will straight away jump into what NEN as a feminist organization has actually uh, put things trying to things put right on the ground to have the last mile impact to reach out to the last woman in the district. And I again would like to say that, you know, uh, accessing justice, rather, the pathway for women to access justice is very is still elusive in India and Assam is not less notorious. And in this regard, we have seen that why is it that we always talk of laws for women why is it that we are talking of fast-track fast track courts in delivering justice to women? The, it has to be women. And, there is, and we are not going to compromise about it. There are no two ways about it. My speaker, who is also a friend of mine, I think my previous speaker has left. Why do we need these laws? And why do we need fast-track courts for women? Don't stop at fast-track courts full stop. For women, it is to address and redress a historical injustice on women. We want to give justice to our grandmothers. We want to give justice to our mothers. We want to give justice to us. We want, and we don't want our daughters to go to a fast track courts. So this discussion, this movement, this debate will continue 
and that is going to take another hundred and hundred and hundred of years. Only when we will be able to change this banner and say, fast track codes for all. Now when I see what the constitution of India is very clear, everybody is equal in the eyes of the law. Nobody, and there are so many laws for women, but there are many problems. Why? Both women and men have unmet justice needs and there is no denial about it. And but because of women's, when I'm talking of women, I include, but I will continue to say women, women, because of women's different identities and positions in the society, their justice needs actually require critical attention. And that is why we have this course, that is why we have this seminar, or else we wouldn't have been here today. But what happens is, because of our lived experiences, women face violence, exploitation, exclusions, marginalization, and discrimination. And it is for these reasons that women, there are specific gender bias, there are specific barriers and biases in the justice mechanisms and systems because of which women are not able to grab those opportunities. Previous speakers have already said our systems are not enabling, our systems are not inclusive, and our systems are not gender responsive. That is why women of different identities, whether she belongs to, uh, whether she is a uh, woman who belongs to the LGBTQI plus community, the moment she lands up in the police station or in the shelter home, justice is not about courts, justice is not about the police, justice is also about the shelter home. Where a lesbian woman or her partner, she's brought to the home and immediately the phone call comes to her. By the, and do, will, does everybody understand Asmi's here? Except for one or two, would say that, you know, this two women needs correction. That is not justice. Because the shelter room is supposed, supposed to provide an atmosphere where its residents are, you know, are made to feel inclusive. So that is where we go around. Now, what happens is, uh, the other, other problem is about virtual courts, you know, which during the pandemic, there are many examples at the grassroots, at the community level, from Northeast Network, that I could share, but I would just give one more example. During the pandemic, uh, we had just, we, we actually had, uh, there was this announcement that Supreme Court, High Court, Lower Courts would run virtual and treat justice for certain category of cases on a priority basis. That included cases related to bail, that included cases related to POXO, it did not include cases related to maintenance of, maintenance which were filed by women in uh, abusive domestic relationships. So, how how can we keep saying and glorifying a sentence which says justice denied is justice delayed? No. We have to remove those statements from our epitaphs, our history books and our courses, and law books because we don't prioritize the gender experience of women which the courts during that time had said maintenance of women, agreed women, which has been lying in queue for years, even during the pandemic, we would treat them on a priority basis. It did not happen, that is why the many Rahimas and the Ritas came back to us and said, it's not a priority for the court now. So they are, who is denying, who is delaying? We, because we don't actually prioritize them. Now, now coming to the agency of women, do we recognize them as agencies or we because women have never claimed to be victims women have always said that we are rightful we are equal we are equal citizens and we are equal rights holders women never said we are victims of our, victims or recipients of a welfare state so we that's because we do not recognize women's agency and if we do not recognize women's agency women have no control and access over legal resources. There are many resources available for women in the community level and these would be you know, the health lines, the shelter example I already gave, legal aid among others. Let me give the example of Legal Services Authority of India has district legal aid services, state legal aid services. The lawyers who are employed there, they are demotivated. They are supposed to give free services to the women because we work a lot on gender-based violence and we have direct intervention services, they, they are not motivated because their fee is not released on time. 
So once again, the, you know, the, all the women come back. It goes on and on and on. And the, our system is pushing women to the margins as a result of which we are still glorifying the statement justice denied and justice delayed. And I totally disagree. If possible, remove that line and say that you know this is not what we are going to start with. If we start with that, we'll never provide justice to women. And then the other thing is about women have no information, women have no access or control over these resources also because of our customs. In many tribal societies where we are functioning, we have community support services in uh, four districts. Uh, domestic violence is not recognized as violence. What happens is the men and the women are brought to the forefront, the, the the customary arrangement is, you know, the village elders, males will come. There will be women who come as onlookers and witnesses. And only one fifth of the cases reach the formal justice system. They're made to fight. They are fine, and that's where it ends. So the women, it's, it begins, it remains confined to the community level, and they cannot move to the next, uh, to the next steps. And now the other thing is about, again, about the statistics. What has been, with all due respect to all the agencies response mandated to stop gender-based violence, Assam is every year, uh, the NCRB says, this time it's the third in the country, tomorrow it will be the fifth in the country, the other day will be something else, the fifth position in crimes against women in the country. What is a normal answer? Women are empowered, they are coming out of the homes, then we have better systems, we have sensitive law enforcement agencies. All seven well done. But my argument would be, how do we prevent women from going to this to this support to these services? We have to talk of gender-based violence at the household level. We have to talk of gender and violence at the household level. Only then the moment if we can stop here, the women will not go. Women do not have to go and you know, give statements and record the statements or talk about services. Are we are we doing that? Are we doing it at the household level at all or not? If we do, if we talk, if we address gender and patriarchy and gender-based violence on women at the household level, maybe in the future there will not there will be no question of women, you know, going to uh, register cases. And registration of cases is only at the tip of the iceberg. What we are seeing is those cases. And the below the iceberg is much bigger. Like we have seen cases uh, which are registered on domestic violence by our own community support services. I'll show a small video and you'll be able to understand the concept. International instruments, constitutions, laws and laws and laws for women. But these biases remain. Do women misuse laws? To the students I'm asking. Do women misuse laws? Yes. Okay, show of hands. No, I don't ask you to argue. Just a show of hands. Do women misuse laws? Yes. Yes? And I am saying no. And you are asking me why? Who doesn't misuse a law? Do men misuse laws or not? Yes. Yes. So your argument is even all men misuse law. It's a perception in a patriarchy, general perceptions which are glorified by self institutions, textbooks and you know whatever proverbs that you know Mohila uh, Misa Kotha Kare Misolia Tiruta Now who is this Misolia Tiruta? Who is this woman who is lying? I am in a state of, you know I am facing violence I go running, beating my chest to the station police station police says that you know you can put her place on the dowry for 90 and I really don't know I don't really know what to read and write and next day I come away and say that you know I don't know to experience as a case to Uthayo. So I am termed as Misoria. But did anybody ask me why I am withdrawing the case? Because I am under pressure from the family. Prestige. Number two, I'm, I don't even know to read and write. Number three, the justice systems are elaborate, expensive. Thirdly, who's going to pay? I'm not working. Who's going to pay for my children? All the expenses. Nobody has asked me. Day one, I go running to register my case day 5. Between day 2 and day 4, nobody questioned me. Nobody even came to me to ask why did I withdraw my case. So that is why 
we are in a hurry to say Missolia Tirutha and Miren is law, which is completely a myth. Now, to, yes, I think, especially for students, please argue it out. Give this hypothesis. Day one registration, one, two, three, four. This for three days, nobody went to the women to ask anything. Now, it's very difficult for women to navigate through a complex justice system which is not inclusive, which is not gender responsive, which is not sensitive. In, uh, and there are also these customs which are playing, which are playing its part. Now, I won't get so much into st statistics, as already has been said, and with regards to pendency, Assam keeps, you know, it's like that eco graph. This time is the sixth, next time it's very good for reports and media reports and uh, research, you know, work. We need those statistics, figures and theories. But at the ground level, the what, what, what the reasons for pendency is already been said enough. Uh, uh, then there's impunity which is enjoyed by the perpetrators. India's population, I think not just, uh, the Assam's population is 10% uh, of India's population. Uh, and then the, but the share of crimes is 3%. There are delays in FIR. I'll give an example. There are delays in also FIR because police would also say that, you know, letha, let go, why don't you withdraw? This letha, letha is letha is also, is based on those beliefs that, you know, justice hurried is justice buried. We have to get away with that because of, they would also say that, you know, why don't you do some mid march you know, reconciliation, conciliation, everything at different levels. But women are not, you know, they are not those uh, bicharis anymore. You believe women are bicharis, classic victims? They are not random victims in a situation of violence. The risk factor is their gender. They are survivors, they are agents. <coughs> and that is where we have to believe in. And different women belonging to different occupations, whether they are sex workers, belonging to different identities, uh, uh, to the LGBT community, they are doubly marginalized. marginalized. Now, what has NEM done? Because there is hardly any time. I just have 15 minutes. I am cutting short. I would have gone and gone to talk about for women, by women, and for future women. Um, there is no denial about men facing harassment, but we have to question what are we, what, what, what are we uh, talking about? What is the percentage? What are the recorded cases? The gender experience of women in violence is completely different, right? Is it, do, you, do you agree with that or not? It is very different. Imagine a case of sexual violence. Sexual violence still remains a woman's shame. It's a household shame. Who is talking about it? Is anybody talking about it? Those experiences, gender experience of women, you know, alien objects being inserted into women's private parts, manipulation of different parts of the body. That is why there are there are amendments in the law. That is why we immediately need certain justice mechanisms, which will give me, which will provide me some ray of hope. Now, Notice Network is a feminist organization. Starting point is women, end point is women, left wing psychiatric center is women. We are going to talk about gender violence on women. Now, it is based on gender foundation, Notice Network is based, based on gender foundations of feminist change and continuity. So, we have women led initiatives. Because I am supposed to talk from the grassroots, these initiatives are now, I mean, it's a model. And those of you who could visit can go and see the concept in Mirza. We have it in Sipajar, Gulaghat, Udangri, and also in, uh, very soon I'm coming up with the same concept in Hemaji. We have actually built capacities and agencies of women. First recognize agencies of women, then build the capacities. These are women who are like any one of us, but not like the way you and I have studied MA or you know, or an attribute. They are women from the ground, from the community who are trained on barefoot counseling, number one. They go from house to house because I'm supposed to talk of experiences from the grassroots. They distribute flyers on domestic violence in local language and they say that here is a forum for the last woman in the district that you could come to us. 
they have community meetings and campaigns and they do a lot of interface with the local governments. That is the district social welfare office and other places. They work within an ecosystem where they would approach the police, the lawyers, the social welfare protection officers, and it is not just, they don't just go when there is a when the case is registered, but they also what they do, they actually uh, dialogue and reveal capacities of the local uh, machinery in that particular area. So uh, and these spaces, like any other political space, uh, all feminist organizations are political spaces. The Rami Mahila Kendras in the villages are also safe political spaces managed by community women, led by community women. Because it is here that they talk of collective activism, that they talk of women's leadership at the grassroots level. Feminist leadership cannot remain confined to certain tables and offices and organizations or departments, institutions. They must filter down to the uh, grassroots. That is where women's access to justice can be more enabling. And, uh, and then this, is, this is a space where we can talk of mutual protection. We talk of communities of women. Here are the communities of women. They are there everywhere. We just need to recognize them, build their capacity, believe in their agency, and move forward. They come together in family solidarity and sisterhood, and they register the cases. If they don't want to register cases, then they are provided counseling. When they want linkages to be built for divorce or for a police intervention, they work in and around the uh, ecosystem. So this is how they are doing. And I will show a small video rather than talking. And somebody was asking about harassment. You know what happens in harassment? Your question, we are all grappling with these questions. Harassment is of different types. Harassment which requires, which is administrative in matter, that will go for disciplinary action. You have your code of conduct, you have your, what is it called, service rules, you know, refer to those. And for sexual harassment, we have what is called the internal committee. It is no longer called the internal complaints committee. Just, you know, you need to correct. It is called the internal committee. So those are there. If there is violation in your wages, we have the labor codes, the labor laws. So what? The uh, organizations need to do is to put this into a policy that you know for the for harassment of this nature, this is what we are going to do. For labor law violation, this is what we are doing. For sexual harassment, this is what we are doing. Going to do sexual harassment is most complex. The denial that you know that we don't want to believe. Amarta Abate Department Soli has limited one Instead of registering that case and establishing it as a case of sexual harassment and establishing that there is a violation of the woman's autonomy, her bodily integrity. First is about character assassination. We will end up looking at Facebook pages, Insta pages of the woman, how she's dressing up, her profile picture on WhatsApp, and we deny justice to the woman. That's where we have to break the myth and move on. Thank you. Since I'll be leaving, uh, you can, uh, I'll show a small video which is just 5 minutes uh, of women's access to justice at the grassroots level, community initiatives by Northeast Network. I'll take you questions as well immediately after that. Thank you very much. Eight years ago, in 2014, the Northeast Network laid the foundations for the community to evolve into the Browning Mahila Kendra model, an initiative of men that addresses head on and from the ground up the complex and many layered issue of gender based violence against women and girls. A sound record of the highest rate in the country of crimes against women for the fourth consecutive year, according to the National Crimes Record Bureau application of 2020. <coughs> Assam also witnessed a shadow pandemic, with men's ground in Mahila Kendras recording 27 cases of domestic violence in three districts between April and July of 2020. The biggest challenge to justice was the existing attitudinal barrier, one that is targeted, systemic, and structural in nature. Add to this moral policing and character assassination, one ends up dealing with not just crimes against women, but also 
the few and stigmatized faces in society due to their lived experiences. Uh, the Tamil Nadu's identity and the community has seen spaces for many women, and this model is seen as a good practice, and it engages the stakeholders from the homes to the street level. And in this, we see that uh, the community mobilizing, that is the welfare counselors, they provide psychosocial care and counseling to all the women in the villages, and such services are recognized by the state. Set up in four districts across the sun. In Kamrup's Mirsa village, Tarun Sepajar village, Kolakat's Dorun village, and Uttarakuri's Nustola village, the centers are actively assisting women suffering violence at home and in their communities. Besides offering psychosocial counseling, barefoot activists also assist women in referring cases of domestic violence, sexual harassment or abuse, and trafficking to various state agencies engaged in the legal system. Thank you, Madam. 
highly enlightening and intriguing deliberation on issues pertaining to women's lack of access to justice, inadequacies of justice delivery mechanism, so on and so forth. We have significantly brought out the constraints faced by women at the grassroots while fighting different forms of injustices and how women have been historically marginalized which continues even today. I really wish we could have paused time to continue to listen to you more. Uh, so with these words I, I again offer my deep gratitude and thanks to on behalf of the organizing committee to you madam for being with us and encouraging us with your presence and for your very very enlightening deliberation. Thank you madam.